the Sandusky Register. He then joined the Cleveland Press in 1963 as a general assignment reporter. He covered local and national events, including the assassination of Robert Kennedy, the Vietnam War, the Sirhan Sirhan trial, civil rights movement, anti-war demonstrations, and every major political convention. In 1971, he was promoted to columnist, with his column also appearing in the Akron Beacon Journal. He has won numerous awards, including three Haywood Brown Cleveland Newspaper Awards and a National Ernie Pyle Award. In 1974, he began delivering television commentaries on NBC's Channel 3 Action News program. In addition, now he hosts Fagler, a live weekly interview show seen on Saturdays at 7 p.m. His program deals with the relevant pressing issues facing Cleveland. He is well known for his incisive wit and uncanny ability to simplify complex issues. A native of Cleveland's east side, he now lives in Lakewood. It is with great pleasure that we present to you our special guest speaker, Mr. Dick Fagler. Thank you very much, distinguished clergymen and educators, men and women of the graduating class, their parents. It is a humbling experience to be asked to speak to a graduating class. At least it was until I found out a week ago that a college somewhere in this country had invited, as that college's commencement speaker, Vanna White. Now, Vanna White's address was not widely covered, but I was somewhat curious, since I knew I was going to come here to make an address of my own, to see what Vanna White had in fact said. And I read an account which said that she had said that she really felt she wasn't necessarily the person to be making such a speech because she didn't think she was wise enough but that if she could say anything at all to you, what she would say would be, do your best and everything will come out all right. I imagine for that she got about $5,000. Well, I'm going to do Vanna White one better, literally. I only want to say two things to you, though I'm going to amplify each a little bit. I'm going to limit myself to two because you'll kill me if I go on to three because you want to come up here, get that diploma, and leave. Yeah. I'll let you in on a little secret. There is a group in this audience that is far more relieved and anxious to see you with that diploma in your hands than you are. I'll tell you how I know that. I have sat in a high school where you're sitting once in my life. I have sat up there four times in my life. And there's no question that I felt an awful lot better sitting up there watching this moment of triumph than I really sat down there. How about a hand for the people who made all this possible, your parents? The parents I know. Two things, and I'm going to sit down. One, life is not a television show. Now, you would think that might be a fairly obvious statement. Didn't need me to drive down here and say that. But it's not so obvious, because television has largely, in our society, replaced life. We get our perception of life mainly off of television. The latest statistics I have read, and I don't believe them either, but I read them, they come out from reputable organizations, say that television viewing is down a little bit. The average American now only spends a little more than seven hours a day watching television. Now, I read these things, or I should say, we in television read these things and check our heads and say, why are they doing that? We don't know.
It seems like an awful lot. But what we do know in our perambulations around society is that television has replaced life. In that, people get their cues of what reality is like now off that screen. And everything in life is cut and sawed and made to fit what's on that screen. We now elect senators and presidents through television primarily based on their ability to be anchormen. And you know what the chief requisite is for being an anchorman on television? What's the one thing you suppose you have to have to be an anchorman on television? One thing. Have to have hair. Have to have what is known as anchor hair. Now I haven't got anchor hair. I got Christopher Columbus hair. Hey, I get up in the morning and shave and look in the mirror and my hair is sailing slowly over the horizon of my scalp. It's like the, what the name of those three boats, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Taco Bell, sailing slowly over the horizon of my scalp. And I wave goodbye every morning to my hair. But real anchormen either have to have a lot of hair or they got to buy it. And anchormen who are really born anchormen don't have the problem I've got because normally you'll find out your hair recedes from front to back like this, see, like mine's doing. See, see it leaving? Okay. An anchorman, when his hair starts to leave, it leaves from back to front, like that. Okay. When he gets bald, he's still got a little bit here, but there's nothing back there because he doesn't need that. Because on television, pictures are usually shot this way. Front view. All you need is a flat surface with a good front on it. On television, the world is flat. Television shows are contrived to grab an audience, whether they're television shows hyping the Democrats or the Republicans, whether they're hyping President Bush, or whether they're hyping Governor Dukakis, or whether they're hyping God. On most religious television shows, God is a sidekick. And the anchor man on most religious television shows is the preacher who is saying, Send the money. Television has a way of exalting anchor types and leaving spirituality and thought out. And if people are spending seven hours a day watching television and seeing that, I'm afraid they begin to think that spirituality and thought aren't important. That would be a mistake because life is not a television show. Life is not full of entertainment value. Some of the things that are most worth having in life are tough to get and hard to get. You didn't want to go to school every day. You didn't want to do that homework. You did it because you had to do something like that. It was difficult for you to get this diploma you're getting today. Now, I don't want you thinking well, I've worked. Some of you are going to go on to college. I'll work there. I'll get the piece of paper. Then I got the piece of paper. Then I'll take it easy. Because the best things in life have to be struggled for. And television doesn't teach that. Television teaches you that you can sit there passively with a zapper in your hand and go from NTV to CNN to Channel 3 to Channel 5, stopping long enough to look at something that engages your interest and then going on. Life isn't like that. I'll give you an example that I hate to give because I don't want to be put in a position of condoning this substance, but let's talk about beer for a minute. It's a reaction I hoped I'd have. An awful lot of you have had beer in your life, even though I guess it's illegal for you to have had it, isn't it? But you've had it. And a lot of you are going to go out and probably have some tonight. And if you do that, I sure hope you don't get behind the wheel of a car and drive anyway. But I don't want to talk about that aspect of beer, the lethal aspect of it. I want to talk just about how beer tastes. Because everybody who has ever had his first or her first sip of beer ever in life, 99% of you, if I gave you beer and you didn't know what it was and you'd never heard of it before and I had said, try this, and you tried it, you would have said, yeah!
<coughs> you have had to acquire a taste for beer, those of you who have had it. You've had to search in beyond that initial bitter taste to see if there was anything that was a payoff for you. And why have you done that? The only reason you've done that is because you've heard that beer is something desirable. You've seen commercials on the television with cowboys. There are 19 cowboys in America, and during football season, they round them all up, and they ride around making beer commercials. You've seen drinking dogs with a couple of luscious babes on its elbows or arms or whatever dogs have. You get constantly bombarded with messages from society that there's something decent about this bitter-tasting stuff, and so before you know it, you have learned to like it. Now, isn't it a shame that Brahms or Bach or Beethoven or Shakespeare doesn't have the same kind of PR going for him that beer's got going for it. Because a lot of the worthwhile attainments in life operate on the olive theory. Yeah, at first, I can't stand it. But if you acquire a taste for it, you get reward. And the only way you acquire a taste is by working. And television generations don't like to work. They like to sit and zap. Life is not a television show. From this moment on, you are a player. All those people you see flinging across that screen have really very little to do with you. You got to go out and do it yourself. And if you think you have formed a set of values and priorities, as the Reverend said, that are more important than you, those you see on the tube, I think you're probably right. And go with those. Be the best possible people you can be. Go with those. Point two, and then I'm through. Life is not a television show, and point two is something I throw in for the parents, primarily. Love is not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. That's something that I always think about this time of year when the sap is rising in the trees and in some of the saps. And I drive down the highway and see all these bridges that say, Angela loves bark on them, you know. And hundreds of people are falling in love, falling in love. Some of you perhaps are in love. Some of you are going to leave with your diploma and fall into love. Some of you are going to enter into relationships that you call love, and you're going to say, I feel like I'm in love, and you're going to go home and tell your mother, Ma, I don't want to go to college because I feel like I'm in love. Ma, I don't think, uh, you know, I ought to make any long-term plans because I feel like I'm in love. And your parents are going to go, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> Because they know that love is not a feeling. The feeling that you have when you feel like you're in love is the same feeling you'd have if I showed you a nice Camaro. People who fall in love at your age very often gaze soulfully into each other's eyes and say, will this feeling last? Do you think this feeling, will we always feel this way? You should ask me, I'll answer that question. The answer is absolutely not. Eh? But people who think love is a feeling get very disturbed when the feeling goes away. And as the Reverend alluded to earlier, what they tend to do in our society is trade up. You get your Camaro and you say, well, I used to like that car, but gee, now that I look at it, it's a little rusty here and the tire's a little low there and both these little ripped. And I don't feel the same way about it as I felt. But then they're making a grand am now. Boy, that makes me feel like I like it. They trade up. Now, if love were a feeling and that's all it were, there'd be nothing wrong with that that I can see. No, well, why not? Get rid of the old model, get a new model. Trade up. But love is not a feeling. Love is a decision. Love is an effort of not just the viscera, but it's an effort of the intellect. It's an effort of the spirituality that you have inside you. Love is a feeling. Love is a decision. 
to try to enhance your own or somebody else's spiritual growth. So as you set out on the next couple of years, which are going to be the most adventurous couple of years you're going to have for a while, set out thinking that life is not a television show and set out thinking that love is not a feeling. That's one more thing than Vanna White told her class. So I figure at least I've done better than Vanna White did today. But I do want to add another thing when I talk about love and television shows and things like that. Look around. I walked in here and I thought, it's beautiful. It really is. To you, it's the old gym, see? But I haven't been in here before. Nice blue runner. Your colors, I guess, are what? Blue and white or blue and gold? Blue and white. Nice blue runner up here. Everybody's wearing blue and white flowers. Jim is decked out and decorated the plants. Choir, band. Look around. Take a picture in your mind to carry with you in the locket of your heart of this moment. Because it isn't just something to get away from. That's the way you feel now. Let me out of here. It's something that whether you like it or not, whether you even enjoyed this school or not, you're always going to have with you after you've forgotten an awful lot of other things you think are more important right now. So take a look around, and as you do, look to the right, look to the left, look up in those bleachers where your parents are, and think to yourself that you're steeped now in the right setting, at the right place, at a momentous springboard, point in your life, surrounded by people who love you and who have given to you, it is really one of life's good moments. Thank you for asking me here today. Goodbye. Thank you, Mr. Fagler. I spent a very long time trying to decide what, I, what it was I wanted to say this afternoon. A lot of thought and a lot of reflection over these past four years, and especially this, this last year, really didn't help me make up my mind. Then I came across a book I haven't looked at in quite a while. Uh, only a few people know it. it's one of my favorites. I would like to read it to you. It's very short, so don't worry. It will only take a few moments to relate to you. It is by Maur Maurice Sendak and it's called Where the Wild Things Are. This is what it looks like. This is the way it goes. The night Max wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind and another. His mother called him Wild Thing, and Max said, I'll eat you up. So he was sent to bed without eating anything. That very night in Max's room, a forest grew and grew and grew until his ceiling hung with vines and the walls became the world all around and an ocean tumbled by with a private boat for Max and he sailed off through night and day and in and out of weeks and almost over a year to where the wild things are. And when he came to the place where the wild things are, they roared their terrible roars and gnashed their terrible teeth and rolled their terrible eyes and showed their terrible claws till Max said, be still and tamed them with the magic trick of staring into all their yellow eyes without blinking once. And they were frightened and called him the most wild thing of all and made him king of all wild things. And now, cried Max, let the wild rumpus start. Now stop, Max said, and sent the wild things off to bed without their supper. And Max, the king of all wild things, was lonely and wanted to be where someone loved him best of all. Then all around, from far away across the world, he smelled good things to eat. So he gave up being king of where the wild things are. But the wild things cried, oh, please don't go. We'll eat you up. We love you so. And Max said, no. The wild things roared their terrible roars and gnashed their terrible teeth and rolled their terrible eyes and showed their terrible claws. But Max stepped into his private boat and waved goodbye and sailed back over a year and in and out of weeks and through a day 
and into the night of his very own room where he found his supper waiting for him and it was still hot. I know you're wondering what I'm talking about now. <laughs> but if you stop and think about the story for a moment, it's very applicable to you young people right now. You're about to embark on a journey, one, however, that you can't come back from. Uh, supper's not going to be waiting and hot anymore. You are, however, prepared and ready to start this journey, whether it be to college, a job, or another career. Each of you is a success right now. I can't see any reason why you won't be a success over the years to come. My congratulations on your accomplishment. My thanks to you for being the good people that you are. I now take great pleasure in presenting the class of 1989 to the men members of the Madison Board of Education. These students have successfully completed all requirements for graduation as set forth by the State Department of Education and the Madison Board of Education. Accepting on behalf of the Board of Education is Mr. J. Fabian, President. Thank you, Mr. Leach. We accept these graduates with great pleasure, and we're very proud of you. It was 21 years ago that we, Mr. Leach and I, in the same graduating class, sat in your, your seats. We actually was at the Memorial Middle School, or at the Memorial High School at the time. Things that you would like to say to you about, you get what you give. Get what you give. You give of yourself, you receive many things. You give of yourself within your future education, within the jobs that you have, that you're going to be coming to, you'll get a lot out of it. Another little word that I had from somebody that said, you make your own luck. The harder I work, the luckier I get. That's pretty profound because a lot of people say, oh, look how lucky you are. Believe me, people, you must work at anything and everything you do. Work hard on yourself, your own improvement, in your jobs, on your marriage, in your future education. One thing we must realize is that we're going to be continuing our educations throughout our lives. Your class, your people in your class will probably, statistics say, change three to four vocations in your lifetime. Not jobs, vocations. So you're going to have to keep yourself prepared at all times. Now's the time that you're moving into adulthood. Thank your parents, thank your teachers and your administrators for preparing you, telling you what to do, where to sit, be quiet, make noise. No longer are you going to have those people telling you to do those things. Those will be your decisions, your responsibility. You must be, take full responsibility for your own actions, your failures, your mistakes. Accept them as your mistakes. Learn from them, make adjustments, and go on. Also, accept and recognize your own successes. Many people will try to take those good feelings of successes away from you. Don't let them. You did it. You deserve the feelings of those success. Good luck with your future. We're all proud of you. And may we continue on with the diplomas. Thank you, Mr. Fabian. Mr. Fabian will present the first series of diplomas. Sonia D. Latin. <laughs> Linda Sue Bowers. Angela K. Clark. Christopher J. Cummings. Amy Marie Grist. April Nawako Heck. Mary Lynn Hine. Todd Allen Herbeck. 
Sherry Jean Janko. Pamela Jean Johnson. Gretchen Ray Bonner. Andrew J. Leitert. Tom Masterman. Michael Adler. Grayson Lee Alexi. Lisa L. Alford. Walter W. Alley. Carla Marie Andrakanich. Deborah Ann Arthur. Brian Hegland. Sherry L. Baker. Christine M. Baldwin. Lenny G. Barkley. Teresa Barkley. John Joseph Bard. Lisa Marie Bush. Diane Marie Caldwell. John W. Clayman. Bonnie Lou Henshaw. Eric Wayne Miller. Catherine Carol Buttermore. Richard B. Brimer, Jr. Michelle Sue Carroll. Sherry J. Carroll. Angela Marie Caswell. Wendy Michelle Clark. John T. Sicello II. Mark Clark. Rebecca Lynn Drury. James J. Dennison. Dale DeFranco. Rhonda L. Dixon. Jeffrey Scott Dodrell. Philip Daniel Drake. Lori Ann Davis. Paul C. Dye. Richard Anthony Easterbrook. Terrence Miles Eaton. Jeffrey B. Ellis. Celeste Marie Eubank. Brooke T. Fadley. Now presenting diplomas will be Mr. David Foote. Matthew Charles Hawes. Robert J. Yeager. Charles R. Hudson. Tanya Lynn Hearn. Peggy Lynn Baker. Julie Ann Bucky. Jennifer Lynn Herter. Matthew J. Heitman. Jennifer Lynn Hinkleman. Timothy A. Hipley. Keith A. Hockman. Holly L. Horvath. Wendy L. Howe. Hyun Hee Kim. Cindy S. Lanning. Nadine Grace Kirsch. Brian Keith Klein. Kendra M. Knight. Thomas Michael Sill. <laughs> Philip A. Copel. Richard A. Coolman. Chastity E. Lanham. Joseph M. Kinney. Eric R. Laufenberger. Ralph E. Locks. Tamra L. Lehman. Kimberly Ann Myers. Thomas E. McGuire. Stephen C. Merrill. Diane F. Metcalf. Larissa Ann Reichert. Richard D. Miller. Rob P. Miller. Paula K. Manillo. Sharon Marie Minor. Jennifer Lee Moberg. 
Michelle Lee Mooney. Gregory D. McC